What's up, everybody, and welcome to the week six matchups breakdown here on the DraftKings TV channel. I'm David Kitchen, Soccer Dave. Joining me, fellow DraftKings analyst Drew Dinkmeyer, Andrew Wiggins, and the one, the only Adam Levitan. Guys, we've got a pretty good game for this Thursday night slate, and uh, I'm curious. Let's just start. Let's just start right off the bat, Adam, with the. Uh, New Orleans and the Falcons, as far as I'm pretty sure there's one guy, if you're playing in this Thursday night slate, at least one guy that you want to roster. Yeah, and you're talking about Willie Dynamite, the need for Sneed, fast Willie, um, just a total uh, lock at 3,300. I, I mean, I think that he's going to see anywhere from seven to nine targets in this game. I think he'll avoid Desmond Trufant enough where he'll be very effective. I, I think not as talented as Brandon Cooks, but he has severely outplayed Brandon Cooks. We also know Marcus Colston is almost certainly out with his shoulder injury, so it would be hard for me to make a Thursday lineup without Willie Sneed. Um, it's also hard for me to make lineups without Devontae Freeman, considering how much uh, usage he's getting. I mean, I would project another 22 to 25 touches for Devontae Freeman in this spot, another plus spot, and this is the second highest over under of the week. Um, it's not going to be one of those normal, like sluggish Thursday games that we see sometimes. This is the fast track in New Orleans with two pretty bad defenses. I know the Falcons have played better lately, but still two pretty bad defenses. Um, I think Julio is going to be overowned given his injury. I think people are going to be off Hankerson given his injury. Um, but yeah, for me, Sneed, uh, Sneed and, uh, and Freeman for sure. Uh, Drew, as far as you, do, uh, do you think that Julio is like the risk that you probably don't want to take tonight? That's my feeling on it. And I think in general, in Thursday games, you tend to get players a little bit over-owned over where they would be if they were playing on Sunday games. And so the benefit to playing Julio would be the hope that people would be scared off by this hamstring injury and maybe you could get him at a lower ownership level in the tournament. But because it's a Thursday night game, I think that sort of eliminates that thought process. And so I think you're playing just the risk side of the spectrum, not really the reward side of the spectrum. So I'm, uh, I'm very unlikely to own Julio in tournaments or in cash games uh, this evening. Uh, Andrew, as far as game theory, you're playing Thursday night contest in a GPP, a guaranteed prize pool, a big tournament. Do you think about fading tonight's options as uh, a way to, let's say, that Sneed or Friedman doesn't go off? Do you feel like that might be a, a way to go with uh, one of your lineups? It's tough. Uh, I think they're both in the territory that they're such good plays that I'm, I would probably just go ahead and play them, especially with Willie at such a low price. Uh, and Colston being out, with what he's done the, the past few weeks, he's only going to get – probably more snaps and more looks with, with Colston gone. Uh, and as far as Freeman, I mean, he's, he's been the best back in the league over the last few weeks. And we were just talking about how Julio's banged up. Uh, it's very possible he could re-aggravate it and leave the game. And if that's the case, it's going to continue to flow through Freeman. So I'm okay fading him in tournaments more so than Snead because his price is elevated. And Snead is just so cheap at 3,300 that you don't need that much. And probably more importantly, I don't see a lot of guys around that price point that uh, I think are even in the range of his play. I mean, you could play someone like Cecil Shorts or um, Michael Floyd, but they're just really a cup below Sneed. So I think Sneed, I'm locking in. Freeman, maybe I could get on board, but man, he's played really well lately. All right. Uh, also, we have uh, Washington at the Jets for our first game. And uh, Drew? We'll go to you as far as what you think about the game. I think it's probably going to be a slower paced game. I think ideally both these teams offensively would like to run the ball, but I think both defenses are set up well to be able to prevent the other from running the ball. So I think this is kind of going to be um, just a, just a messy sloppy game that doesn't entice a lot of fantasy intrigue. The guys that I like, I like the Jets defense quite a bit. I think they're really great at home against Kirk Cousins who's got a 4.2% uh, interception rate in his career, which is pretty high historically and um, has given up 25 interceptions in the 19 games he's played. So you're almost guaranteed uh, a turnover with, with Cousins at the helm. So I like the Jets defense. And then 
I like some of the receivers on the uh, Jets side. I like Brandon Marshall, although the price is elevated and there's guys I like around him. I think it's a good matchup against that defeated and injured Washington secondary. And I think Eric Decker is always an interesting tournament play for how involved he is around the red zone. All right, uh, Adam, what are your thoughts about this Washington Jets game? Yeah, the interesting play for me is Derek Carrier. This is a guy who played 95.2% of the snaps last week, ran 30 pass routes, was only asked to bat pass block five times. And we know about his athletic skill set. He was a wide out in college, kind of had freak measurables uh, on a week where there's not very many punts. Like outside of Trey Kendrick West, I don't really see anybody under 4,000 that I really am excited about playing if you're not playing the Thursday slate with Willie Sneed. Uh, is it a mistake trying to punt with Derek Carrier for 2,500? Drew, uh, my only my only concern with it is that it would it might prevent me from using Gronk, and I really want to use Gronk. Um, so I like the price point on Carrier. I don't mind the matchup because I actually think because the Jets are so strong with their corners that that often funnels passing opportunities to the middle of the field to tight ends to running backs and. And such. So I think Carrier will get more than the three targets he saw last week. There are actually some other cheap tight ends that I like as well, um, other than Carrier. But I, I think he's he's an acceptable option. I just I want to have Gronk. I want to have as much Gronk as I possibly can. So um, unless I'm considering Carrier in the flex, I'm probably going to fill that spot with Rob Gronkowski. Yeah, I, like you said, there's some other cheap options. I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but Larry Donnell, if Odell Beckham doesn't go, 2800 is going to be a decent option. Fun fact, though, last week, I had two lineups. One had Carrier, one had Gronk. $5,000 difference, same points, same exact points on DraftKings. Uh, so I, I'm just going to... Not such a fun fact? Yeah. No, I'm going to just listen to Andrew from here on out. Uh, as far as, like, he's a tight end whisperer. He's the one that begged me to play Antonio Gates. I did not listen to him. So uh, he is, whether he likes it or not, he is a tight end whisper for oh. this matchups breakdown show. So let's go to uh, St. Louis at Pittsburgh. You had a crazy Monday night. Um, uh, Adam, as far as the Martavis Bryant stuff, what are you hearing? Yeah, it looks like he's a go. I mean, I'm not sure why he didn't come off the reserve slash suspended list last week. Maybe they just didn't think he was ready from a conditioning standpoint, or maybe he was a little hurt. I'm not really sure, but he is going to go, but it doesn't matter. Like I, I know – it matters. doesn't matter to you that Michael Vick is playing quarterback, but to everybody else in the world, Michael Vick playing quarterback is a massive, massive problem for this offense. I even thought that Le'Veon Bell was kind of lucky to get to his 25 points, given that Michael Vick was kind of being playing so bad. It was clustering up the whole offense. And, um, you know, with Vick likely to start again, I know Ben Roethlisberger is throwing a little bit again, but with with, uh, with Vic likely to start again, I'm kind of struggling to pay 8500 for Le'Veon Bell in a far, 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 far tougher matchup than the one he had on Monday night. I mean, San Diego might have the worst run defense in the entire league, and Arizona at worst is like a top third uh, run defense, I think. So, um, yeah, definitely scary for me to roster any of the Steelers while Michael Vick is under center. Yeah, uh, Andrew, I'll go to you because that's a good point. And to be, to be fair, I'm, I'm not even on Vic this week. So <laughs> nobody, even with Bryant back, nobody worry. I'm not even on big. Um, but the Le'Veon Bell, you raise an excellent point because there are running backs that are cheaper than him that might be in, in better spots. And and then again, some cheap running backs. So Andrew, your thoughts on, on using Bell, who looks like to be an automatic 25 points, regardless of what game he's playing in. Yeah, I don't know if he's an automatic 25 points this week, uh, but – one thing about Arizona is they are a really tough run defense, but they do seem to allow some receptions to running backs, I think, more so than, than many other teams in the league. So it's very possible that Bell might not ha have a lot of room to run, but he could have one of those games where he has seven, eight, nine catches, and if he does that, he's probably going to return value. But at 8,500, he's a lot. I think he's a really big decision point this week, and I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going to go. You never feel good not having Le'Veon Bell, uh, but it's not quite the slam dunk play it was last week. One thing I would say to keep an eye on is there's some whispers that Big Ben might try and go this week. And if you take a look at the spread right now, it would indicate that he's not going to play. And that's always a good thing to look at. If you start hearing rumors about a player that's going to influence the game a lot, uh, maybe playing or not, you can take a look at the spread and see if it's moved in a direction that would indicate that maybe he's going to play. And right now, it doesn't look like he'll play. 
but maybe that'll change if he starts practicing more as the week goes on. Of course, he plays. The whole offense gets upgraded, uh, including Le'Veon Bell. Uh, Drew, you want to weigh in on the, the Bell situation? Yeah, I, th- I think they've largely covered it the right way. And I think Andrew's point about the, the line – you know, favoring Arizona right now and suggesting that Vic is going to play is interesting, especially because I, I would have thought with the the whispers that Ben had, you know, started throwing on the side and different things that that line might be pulled off the board. Um, and it's, you know, it seems like Vegas is pretty confident that Vic is going to be the one starting there. Um, I like the Arizona side of this game from a DFS perspective. I think the passing game is really interesting. The Steelers, uh, you know, we saw Phillip Rivers move the ball up and down the field on them. Uh, last week, we've seen this throughout the season that uh, opposing offenses haven't had problems throwing the ball against Pittsburgh. Larry Fitzgerald has obviously been great early in the season. I think his price point is still investable. I like Carson Palmer. And I think the interesting thing about Arizona's offense is they're only averaging 30 pass attempts per game, and Larry Fitzgerald is still like the number two wide receiver in fantasy football. This is an offense that averaged 35 and a half pass attempts per game last year, and a lot of game script issues have forced them to not be able to pass the ball as much this year. So I think you're likely going to see those passing attempts rise as the season goes on, which just creates more opportunities for guys like Larry Fitzgerald, Carson Palmer, and John Brown. So I really like the Arizona passing uh, side of this game. All right, so let's move on to uh, the Chiefs and the Vikings. And there's one guy here, Charkandrick West, uh, who's the guy that everyone's been talking about. And this is also – this is a big season-long story, right? Because Jamal Charles was taken the first round. Everybody's using their free agent acquisition budget on West. And so I feel like more than ever, this he might be the chalkiest play of the week, Adam. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think he'll be like 20% in the Millie Maker. And I think Le'Veon Bell might be 27 or 28 or something like that. But, but I do think West will be popular. I mean, uh, I thought that – appropriate bid on levy on charge Kendrick West in the season long was like 65 to 70 percent of your FAAB budget I know Dink went full YOLO 100 percent of his uh of his FAAB budget in the league that we're in together um you know after Jamal Charles got hurt on Sunday Charles Kendrick West out snapped Niall Davis 18 to 4 the Chiefs also worked out guys like Ben Tate Pierre Thomas um Bryce Brown declined to sign any of those guys to say they listen we're going to ride with Chark Hendrick, Niall Davis and Spencer Ware who is kind of a halfback fullback hybrid so I think it's pretty clear that West is ahead of Niall Davis I think um, Spencer Ware is not really a factor I, and I think that the key here is that Chark Hendrick West plays well in the past game similar to former Andy Reid backs like Jamal Charles like Brian Westbrook so um, I like Char Kendrick. Maybe I like him a little bit more than most people, but when I'm looking for value this week, the really the strongest one that I see is Char Kendrick for four thousand. Uh, Drew, any other guys you like in this game? So I, I want to follow the injuries on um, the Minnesota wide receiver core. During you know we we had a bye week with them last week, so we don't really know where Charles Johnson is at physically. Um, the Chiefs have struggled against wide receivers early in the season, but I think some of that is a little bit misleading because they were playing without Sean Smith, who's very, very good. Although then again, you know, Marquise Wilson had another good game last week. So it's it's hard to get a good feel there. But Mike Wallace is really cheap around the industry. Um, the, the concern for me on both sides of the guys I'm interested in DFS is just game script. You know, this could be like a slow, uh, sloggy type game. Minnesota is a, a modest favorite, four points in this one. And the Chiefs have a team total like around 20, just under 20 points. So like that makes me a little bit nervous for Sharkandrick, even though I like his skills and I like that Andy Reid offenses have historically uh, transformed running backs into really good fantasy assets. But this game as a whole just makes me a little bit nervous. I think Adrian Peterson is, is going to be a good tournament play. And I like the Vikings defense um, as well in tournaments. They're generating a lot of pass rush. And the Chiefs uh, offensive line has allowed the fourth highest pressure rate in the NFL. So I think um, there's ways that you can kind of leverage in tournaments against likely high ownership from Sharkandrick West in this game. And that's probably the, the ways that I'm looking most from a DFS perspective for this game. Drew, you, Dink, you don't like Peterson for cash? I like other running backs a little bit more for, for cash. And it's mostly a price thing. 
Yeah. Um, I'm finding the, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollar difference between like Peterson and Forte and Foster. Um, I, I'm finding that money useful when building my roster because you mentioned there just aren't a ton of uh, great standout value plays this week. So every dollar counts. Yeah. I like Foster too. I, we can get to that. I like Foster too. It's just like I have Nuke and all the honks yeah. in, in my cash line. It's like I don't really want to go in a game. Yeah. You don't want to go all in on the Texans offense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But we can, I, I digress. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to the next game. Dink was talking about uh, other running backs that you could leverage, and I got it $600 more as Gio Bernard against Buffalo. Uh, Andrew, what are your thoughts on this game? Well, for one, I don't really like targeting Buffalo, especially with running backs. Uh, what the teams have done that have played Buffalo so far this year is they basically just not run the ball. And so it's kind of interesting because Buffalo is, is, I think, a very good defense. But you look at the stats against them and the receivers and the quarterbacks are putting up pretty good numbers, mostly due to volume. Now, Gio is a bit of an exemption in the sense that he's the guy that's involved in the pass game. So maybe he's out there catching a bunch of passes. Uh, but really, I think it's generally a spot to avoid. The other thing worth um, noting is that uh, – no, I lost my thought there. But, yeah, I, I think it's just a spot that, that I'm going to avoid at that price point when you can get West for $600 cheaper, uh, who's going to be getting plenty of volume, a little bit better matchup. Uh, yeah. Uh, and or Adam, what about you? Yeah, I mean, Andy Dalton is fantasy's number one quarterback through five weeks, and he cost 700 over the minimum on DraftKings. Like, I don't know what he did to the DraftKings pricing algorithm that they hate him so much, but um, I think he has to be considered. I mean, this dude is playing at a legit all-pro level. Buffalo funnels action towards the pass. Um, I don't like using guys at the Ralph like ever, but Andy Dalton could have a bad game for him and score 15 points with ease. And I think his ceiling is up over 20, even in this spot. I, I don't know. Like I like, I'm okay with Dalton for cash, even though I never would think that for guys in the route. Drew. Yeah. This game is very interesting to me for um, all the reasons that Andrew and Adam talked about. So Dalton, I think the price point makes him accessible for cash on DraftKings. I think the matchup is a little bit worrisome on an efficiency standpoint because the Buffalo Bills defense is very good. Dalton's on the road. But I think the difference with Dalton this year in the Cincinnati offense is there are just too many weapons for opposing defenses to try to take away. And when you're able to roll out there, A.J. Green, Tyler Eifert, Giovanni Bernard, Marvin Jones, and Mohamed Sanu in, in five, as five skill position players at the same time, there's going to be an opportunity for the quarterback to distribute the ball um, to an open player. And I think that's the, the really compelling thing about Dalton and that price point. So I think he's viable in cash. I do like Giovanni Bernard. Um, I like him a little bit more in tournaments, um, but I think this is a great matchup for him for a couple of reasons. Andrew mentioned that teams funnel the pass, a uh, 70% pass rate against Buffalo this year, which usually means Gio on the field because Gio is the passing down back. But Buffalo also hasn't been particularly good against the run early in the season. So when you have run against them, teams have had success. And I think that's in large part because they're running out of these spread packages, which is what Geo does. So I think he's really interesting at that 4,600 price tag just because he doesn't get the, the goal line work and the touchdown projections are going to be highly volatile. I think he's better in tournaments but I think he's a really interesting play. And I also like Tyler Eifert in tournaments. I like him in tournaments every single week. I have a hard time trusting any of the individual Bengals receivers in cash games just because there's so many different options that can get spread out on a week-to-week -week basis. But I think they're all compelling tournament options. And if Tyrod Taylor can't go, I like the Bengals defense too. Hey, and just the one other uh, quick thought that I remember I was going to say earlier is that Andy Dalton historically has done very well against poor defenses and done quite poorly yeah. against good defenses. So – I don't think he's going to be the best quarterback in the league, and we're going to have some bad Andy Dalton games, and this is a spot where I'd be a little bit concerned that maybe the offense just doesn't get flying very well. That's the question. Is he a different Andy Dalton now with all the skill position talent at his disposal? I tend to lean that he is, but the schedule has been pretty favorable early in the season, and you mentioned it. Historically, his splits are really wide against bottom half defenses and top half defenses. He, he so I think this well will against, be a pretty telling matchup. He just played well against Seattle, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is Seattle that good, though? <laughs> oh, that, 
that will be something we cover in three or four games uh, from from this one. Uh, so as far though as it it the, the, is the ultimate question as far as good Andy versus bad Andy, and so far we've seen good Andy, good Bengals, Chicago at Detroit. Uh, Andrew, I will give this to you. Yeah, this is uh, this is Detroit Super Bowl. Their chance to get on the board, get an easy win at home. They have a pretty. A uh, pretty healthy team total, a little over 23. Uh, Stafford has been a dumpster fire, of course. Uh, everyone knows that. But um, to be fair, he hadn't been terrible until the last – I mean, he's been bad, but the last game was really where he was awful. He threw three interceptions and got benched uh, around halftime. Now, if you look at his schedule, it's been pretty difficult. He had Denver, um, Arizona, and Seattle. Uh, Seattle, yeah. So it's not like he's had a cakewalk, a couple of those on the road – so I'm not sure he's all of a sudden the worst quarterback in the league. I think we know what Stafford is, and he's a guy that's prone to make mistakes, but he's also prone to put up big numbers. Now, the other question is, has Stafford lost, or has Megatron lost a step? And I think he's probably lost at least half a step. He just doesn't look as explosive, but he's still a really big body. He's got a huge size advantage over the Bears, cornerbacks. I think they're both really great tournament options. As far as being cash options, maybe they're just a little bit too risky, but they're two guys that I really like a lot this week. Uh, Drew, your boy, Marcus Wilson. Boy. My boy, Marquise. He, uh, he, we'll see what the opportunity is because we don't know what the Bears' injury situation will be at wide receiver. Eddie Royal didn't practice yesterday. Alshon did. Alshon was practicing at the end of last week and still didn't play. Um, obviously, if those two are out, I still like Marquise Wilson quite a bit um, at a very cheap and affordable price tag. I believe it's 4000 on DraftKings. That's very investable against a Lions pass defense that isn't really that intimidating. And, you know, he's been very productive in the last two weeks, uh, 17 targets the last two weeks. He's got, I believe, 14 catches uh, for, you know, 160 plus yards and a touchdown. So I do like him as a value play. If the injury situation, if at least one of those wide receivers are out, ideally, if both are out, I'd be more comfortable with Marquise. I'm also interested. I think this game can help win GPPs in a big way this week because this game can go one or two ways. I think it's either going to be a, sh- a shootout or I think it's going to be really sloppy because both defenses can pressure the quarterback a little bit. Both quarterbacks are turnover prone and struggle under pressure, and both secondaries are pretty weak. So I think if the quarterbacks play a good game, we could have a shootout. I think if the quarterbacks play a poor game, it could be really sloppy. Um, The Calvin Johnson stuff is really interesting to me. His average depth of target this year is at 9.2 yards. Last year, he was at 16.3 yards down the field. year before, 15.4 To me, that suggests that they can't get him down the field because they can't protect Stafford, so they're having to cut shorter routes, which makes him a little bit less valuable. But I also think that might be matchup-driven because, as Andrew alluded to, they've played a very, very tough schedule. So I'm interested in Stafford and Megatron. I'm interested in Marquise. um, And I'm interested in Forte, who I like as well. I think the Lions' defense is considered a good run defense, but they're allowing 4.5 yards per carry. They're ranked in the bottom third. Um, of uh, you know football outsiders and pro football focus run defense rankings, so I think Forte is a good play this week as well. Drew Dinkmeyer with the extensive. I knew that you would be extensive on. The I Bears. think this is the most important game of the week to get right, in my opinion. Hey, one thing with uh, Alshon as well is that the Bears have a bye next week, so I think if if it's at all close for them, I would think they would leave him, uh, let let him sit for one more week, and then he'll get the bye. So. I kind of think he doesn't play just because of that, but who knows? He did practice limited fashion yesterday, so keep an eye on that. But if he doesn't go, Marquise Wilson, very nice play. Also, Abdullah, uh, fumble, I, uh, I mean, tons of fumbles. You got Theo Riddick, especially if there's passing situations, 3,300, that could be one of those GPP options as well. Uh, Denver at Cleveland. Adam, I'll start with you in this. Yeah, uh, I mean, Denver going on the road as a favorite to me is solely because of their defense. I don't want to use anybody, just like last week, I don't want to use anybody on their offense. I've said it all year, I'll say it again. Their offense is priced as if Peyton Manning is good, when in fact he's downright bad. So even though Demarius's price continues to come down and Emmanuel Sanders' price continues to come down and C.J., and Hillman, um, it's just not for me to use any of these guys. I think this is a spot where Cleveland can play pretty well um, in a low, low scoring game. I, I, you know, Denver defense for me. Um, the most interesting play on the Cleveland side for me is Duke Johnson because nobody's going to be on him because nobody wants 
to mess with this Denver defense, but I like using space backs and pass catching backs against stout defenses because if they do have success, I think they're going to have to do it that way. I mean, these corners are just going to dominate Cleveland's um, wide receivers. So um, yeah, Duke Johnson and and the Denver D in this game for me. Uh, Adam, I mean, Andrew, any, any thoughts about the, Denver passing situation in and game. Gary Barnage. All thoughts of Gary Barnage, please. <laughs> yes, I'm not touching Gary Barnage as good as he's been. I'm not attacking the Denver defense. Uh, as far as the Denver passing game, I'm also not touching it. I think Peyton Manning's toast. The only situation where I might play anyone from this game is if Ronnie Hillman does not go. I was just trying to get an update on him, and apparently there aren't any, but he did tweak his hamstring in the last game. And if he doesn't go, Maybe this is a spot where C.J. Anderson gets back on track. Um, he's only 4,500, but otherwise, no. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the Browns' defense at 2,200 is like a legit tournament option for um, if you need the cap space for team defense. I mean, who would have thought Browns' defense against Peyton Manning? But – at 2200, I mean, it, it definitely could be in play. Houston at Jacksonville, and as ugly as this game sounds, it there are some fantasy implications, Drew. Yeah, I think the Houston side is obviously really intriguing. They're playing, they continue to play at a really fast pace, which is strange because they're not a very good team. And typically, when you're not a very good team, you try to slow the game down. <laughs> Um, so you don't run as many plays and that that disparity in your skill isn't as uh, apparent. But they're playing really fast and that's allowing a lot of offensive plays for DeAndre Hopkins, who uh, leads the NFL in targets by over uh, or honks by over uh, 10 more than the next best, which is Julio Jones. Uh, Arian Foster was back last week and had 28 touches, which is just awesome for for running back usage. And the Jags defense isn't very good. Uh, we saw Doug Martin light him up last week. Uh, their, their corners aren't particularly good. So I, I think Hopkins and Foster are both viable cash game targets in this one. Adam. Yeah, I mean, Nuke is, I think, going to be the highest owned player in GPPs this week. I think it could get to 35 38% um, on Nuke. And it's hard to argue with that, considering he's on pace to see more targets than any wide receiver in NFL history. Uh, I guess my concern is that with Arian Foster back, they're going to go, hopefully they would go more run heavy as long as the game flow co- cooperates and against Jacksonville, you would think that it would. Um, I want to use Nuke in my cash games. I also want to use Arian Foster in my cash games. I just don't know if I can use them together when we have a team total. I don't even know what it is, 20 or 21 or something like that. All right. Uh, as far as Miami at Tennessee, does anybody want to say anything about this game? Speak now, forever hold your peace. I have two things. <laughs> um, one, I, I think the Titans defense is a cool tournament play. They're generating like the fourth most uh, pass rush in the league. And uh, Ryan Tannehill has a sack rate of 7.5% of his dropbacks in his career. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. And on the other side of the ball, I think Jordan Cameron is an interesting tournament play, like one of those cheap tight ends, just 3,000 on DraftKings. He's a very talented player. He's been consistently the second most targeted player on their offense. We don't know how the coaching change is going to affect their offense, but Tennessee's been putrid against tight ends uh, for most of the year. So I think Cameron's an interesting tournament play. All right, let's move on then. Uh, Even I, as a Tennessee fan, not looking forward to this game. Um, Maybe you go with a naked Mariota, but in just like a $3 GPP. But other than that, I'm not touching anything. Carolina at Seattle, though. Uh, this this one's going to be an interesting one. Um, Andrew, I'll start with you first as far as your initial thoughts. Uh, my initial thoughts are, let's just move on to the next game. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is another game where the, like the Seattle offense, I just don't trust them at all. Even at home, at Carolina's pretty good defense. I want to see something from Seattle before I start playing those guys again. Jimmy Grant is not getting targeted. He's averaging five targets on the year. They keep saying they want to get him the ball but actions speak louder than words. And Ross has no protection, so he's just running for his life out there, but he's not running for positive yards. He's just scrambling around the backfield and then getting taken down. Uh, as far as the other side of the ball, it's just like, dude, I don't want to play any offensive players at Seattle. Maybe Greg Olson as a tournament play because the targets are going to be there. Seattle, if they, if they have a weakness right now, um, 
it would be the tight end position. That's where they're giving up the most fantasy points. But, uh, you know, I did say earlier that maybe Seattle defense isn't that great, but if you, if you want to attack them on the road, that's one thing at home. I just don't see any reason to do it. Adam? Uh, you know, if I told you that Marshawn Lynch was home against Carolina for 6,900 and this was a year ago or two years ago, I mean, this would be like the chalk, mega chalk of the week. Um, it says he's healthy. Um, I don't know how true that is. The Seattle says they still want to get Thomas Rawls eight to 10 carries and Luke Keekley is back for Carolina from his concussion, which I think is big for their defense. So I certainly don't love Marshawn Lynch, but I do want to use him in tournaments because he's going to be a fraction of what I think his ownership should be in this spot. All right. Um, as Drew, um, anybody in this game? Um, it's, I don't really have any statistical data to back this up, um, but it's just game theory. Russ Wilson, if he's going to be continuing to be owned at under 5% in tournaments, I think I'm going to take chances because he's one of the few quarterbacks that has 30 point upside each and every week because of how frequently he uses his legs. The matchup because Carolina will play zone because they've got Luke Keekley coming back just isn't the the type of spot you'd usually attack, but they have a 24 point team total, which is like the fifth or sixth highest on the week. So if I can get Wilson at under 5% in tournaments, uh, a naked Wilson, I'll, I'll take some chances there. Yeah. So you just run him out naked now because I, I was targeting him earlier in the year and I was generally putting him with the Jimmy, but I've been I've been running him naked for two years. <laughs> <laughs> he re- and you really don't know who we had the sweat show a couple of weeks ago where uh, you had a Baldwin that actually did well. I mean, but you don't know week to week uh, who he's going to throw to or who's going to catch one of those deep balls. Uh, San Diego at Green Bay, and this one, this one's going to be uh, pretty heavily owned. Adam, I want to talk to you about Melvin Gordon, though. I mean, he was catching passes and was in crunch time at the end of the game last week. Are you worried about, like, any Woodhead usage there? Like, he's going to start taking over the Woodhead role as well as his normal role? Yeah, I mean, come on. I, I think we realized that Melvin Gordon wasn't going to just, like, take a back seat to Danny Woodhead all season. I thought some of those red zone stats and usage was um, a little bit overblown, kind of like I think Amari Cooper's red zone stats right now are really overblown. Um, but, yeah, my – Bigger problem is that San Diego's offensive line is, you know, maybe mediocre to start with, and then they lose three guys to injury. I just don't want to play Melvin Gordon, especially against the Green Bay defense that's played um, over their head and in a game that figures is going to get away from the Chargers. Um, Given how owned I think Tom Brady is going to be, I think Aaron Rodgers will go under-owned in this spot, even though San Diego does play well against the pass. And the guy that all the quote-unquote experts are on is going to be Eddie Lacy just because he's played so poorly and this is such a perfect matchup for him. Ten-point favorite at home, San Diego, maybe the worst in the league against the run. Lacy is down to 6,300. It's just, I don't know, I'm kind of on team dink where Eddie Lacy is fat and I don't want to play him. Um, but more to be more specific, he does not get a huge market share of his team's carries, which I'm sure Dink can talk more about. I, I just don't love using Eddie Lacy ever. And, um, and I know he's going to be owned by, because a lot of uh, the industry folks are talking about him this week. Andrew, we should go ahead and point out that you told us that Gates was the play last week and uh, I didn't listen. So I'm going to listen to you now. What are your thoughts about Mr. Gates? I think that he's a fade this week. Uh, I wouldn't expect him to do what he did last week again. Last week, it was a perfect spot from both a narrative and matchup. Uh, we can talk about how much the narrative weighs in there, but it was a really good spot for him. And uh, I thought it made sense for him to be heavily involved coming back. And this week, they're going on the road, the 10 point dogs, their team totals at 20. Uh, Green Bay has actually been a pretty formidable defense at home. And they haven't given up very many points to tight ends either. So his price is now up a little bit $400 from last week. Uh, I think that I would prefer Martellus Bennett for $200 more, who I think is in a better matchup. Or the other guy uh, who I think is an interesting tournament play this week at tight end is Travis Kelsey. Uh, it's very possible they get him more involved. And nobody seems to ever want to own Kelsey anymore. So... I think I'm going to stay away from Gates, and he'll definitely be overrun in the tournament. So um, 
yeah, it'll it'll hurt me if he has a big game, but I'm saying fade. There you go. You have uh, you you have the tight end whisperer giving his final thoughts on that. Uh, Drew, your thoughts on this Green Bay offense? I think um, so. I said the Chicago Detroit game. I think is the most important game to figure out in terms of tournaments. I think the Green Bay offense is the second most important thing to figure out this week in terms of tournaments because on paper, uh, San Diego has been very good against the pass, but Green Bay has an implied team total around thirty points and they generally get theirs through the air. And so Randall Cobb, James Jones, still priced affordably, and Rodgers priced affordably, and I think they're all going to go under-owned because of how how good San Diego rates uh, against the pass. And so trying to figure out who's going to really benefit here, I think a lot of people are going to gravitate towards Lacey. I'm still trying to figure out the ownership levels on Lacey because I like his profile for tournaments, but that's without considering ownership. And that profile being... We don't know the usage. The 43% market share of carries is down and makes some cash game risky. But if it rebounds to 60, 65% in an individual game, which we've seen before, he's got two touchdown upside. And historically, he's been more active in the passing game. This year, he hasn't had more than three targets in a single uh, game. So he's been down a little bit this year. But if that rebounds, he's got big upside as well. So for me, it's figuring out ownership on Lacey. I like his profile for tournaments, but trying to figure out that ownership level is what's going to ultimately make my decision on whether I use him or not. Baltimore at San Fran and uh, my Vic love may have been replaced by (sighs) Colin Kaepernick. And uh, I need someone to talk me out of it. Uh, Adam, I'll start with... We, we need Al here. <laughs> like, I think we all might need someone to talk us out of it. And I don't think that person is on, on the set with us today. He's 5K. Uh, Adam, I'll start with you. I love Matthew Stafford this week. I like Kaepernick um, slightly under him. I, I, I mean, Kaepernick gained confidence. There's no doubt on Sunday night, you know, national television against two pretty good corners in Amukamura and Rogers Cromarty played well, um, scored a lot of points. And now he comes home to face Baltimore, Baltimore going across the country. And this is Baltimore secondary has been so underperforming. I mean, Jimmy Smith looks like he's completely lost out there. Um, and that, you know, it's not just going to be through the air, the way he's going to attack them. It's also going to be with his legs and that raises his floor. I think, to 10 points. And we're talking about an absolute floor of 10 points for Colin Kaepernick at 5,000 stone minimum, you know, then everything after that is just gravy. And there could be a lot of gravy in this matchup. So I have no problem whatsoever with Kaepernick in cash. Um, I don't know. Like we all know the Bart Simpson meme or whatever it is. I I just, you know, 5,000 is just brutally low for him in this spot. Okay. Uh, well, there's one person that didn't talk me off of him. Andrew, you want to have a shot at this? Man, I kept going back to the Kaepernick well last year a lot, and it cost me a lot. And I, I remember one time in particular, he was having a really poor game, which was very common for him. And it was down to the last play of the game, and it was uh, for, or whatever, it didn't matter what down it was. They were on the, the goal line, one yard line, and it was quarterback sneak. And I thought, great. Here comes a touchdown. He's going to salvage his day. Instead, he fumbled the ball. Uh, I believe it cost him the game, and it was an eight-point swing for, for fantasy points or seven-point swing. So that that's Kaepernick to me, just breaking your heart every time. I He's so cheap. I, I could I could probably get on board with it. Uh, I keep having this battle in my mind of, you know, do I take the risk with these 5K guys or do I just take Tom Brady? who I know is going to give me 25 and, and has the upside to get up close to 40. And I don't have an answer yet, but uh, Brady sure seems like a great play this week. And we'll get to that game, but I'd be careful with Kaepernick, maybe a little Those bit. Us play Nick Foles, Nick Foles, <laughs> uh, you know, and now we're going to split hairs with Kaepernick and Stafford. I mean, Stafford almost threw for 5,000 yards three years ago. Kaepernick has scored, been a fantasy monster before. And we're, and we we're talking about Nick Foles. We played Nick Foles. You played Nick Foles, and how many points did he give you? Yeah, but he didn't kill me. I still won like 45% of my head-to-heads with, with Nick Foles scoring seven points. That's why 5K quarterbacks are so interesting. Well, and, and part of it's roster construction, too. If you wanted to pay up for Julio Jones, who's not going to be in play really at all, 
definitely not for the weekend slate. If you want to go two expensive running backs, like maybe Bell and Peterson or something, then you can start looking at those cheap quarterbacks. But uh, I don't know. I might go more mid range with with the position players and and spend up a quarterback. I, I haven't really decided yet. Uh, Drew, do you want to weigh in? Um, so I've had a lot of bad history with Kaepernick. I had the Giants defense <laughs> last week, and I feel like I, I, this is where I try to separate my emotions from my decisions because I feel like this is going to be a spot Kaepernick's going to let me down. Like everything, he was great last week, prime time facing a Ravens defense that they have allowed the most fancy points to quarterbacks. And of their schedule so far, they've played three quarterbacks that rank outside the top 25 in fantasy points per game. And they've still allowed the most fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. So everything sets up for Kaepernick to do well. That's usually when he lets me down. I'm trying not to let those emotions impact my decision. It's been difficult, but I agree that the guys I'm, I'm looking at are, are mainly Kaepernick, Stafford, and maybe a little bit of Dalton. I'm struggling to find the value to allow me to pay all the way up for Tom Brady and still like the rest of my skill position players. Right now, that might change as injury situations develop. Um, but right now, I'm considering Kaepernick and Cash, and oh, it hurts me to say that, but everything – statistically points to this being a week that he should at least get 15 to 20 fantasy points. And at that price tag, that's gold. Yeah. I mean, and he, yeah, he allows you to do whatever you want. If you're playing in the Thursday night contest, maybe you, uh, you don't feel like you have to because of just what an awesome value Willie Sneed is, but even Bobby Freeman at seven K uh, you could fit him in there and a few other studs rather than using one of these high priced quarterback speaking of tom brady at indy there is some narrative street here drew i just go start with you because you are the king of deciding if narrative street is real or if it is not real uh and you you tend to pick and choose your situation so is this (laughs) is this a situation where you think it's real i think that's a little unfair maybe it's maybe it's a little fair maybe it's a little unfair um (laughs) But I, I've said before with the narrative street stuff, I think the best players in the game sometimes can control things in a way that allows them to direct statistics in certain directions. And I think Tom Brady would certainly qualify. This Patriots offense would certainly qualify. I think they can score however they want. The last three games against Indy, that has resulted in, I believe it is 13 rushing touchdowns and in each game, at least one back has gone over 150 yards. Um, it's been LeGarrette Blunt. It's been Jonas Gray. It's been a little bit of Stephen Ridley and LeGarrette Blunt. They've been able to run wherever they want, which I think uh, in the last three games has led Brady's production to be somewhat middling. They have every reason to make it so that Brady's production isn't middling this week, given all the offseason controversy and drama. So I like pretty much every pat they've scored six touchdowns offensively in each of the last three games against the Colts. I think any Patriot you get will be able to pay off their price tag. Um, so I'm, I'm loading up on Patriots. All right. Uh, I mean this, you heard it here. I mean, Drew feels like this is the situation where Tom Brady gets his revenge. Is that what you're saying, Drew? I think I think he can. I think they can do whatever they want. So I think if he if he wants to throw for five, I think he can throw for five. I just wanted to back you up in a corner. So thank you. There you go. All Nobody right. Nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> I can't believe we had a dirty dancing reference on this matchups breakdown. Uh, Adam, your thoughts on this game? Yeah, the interesting thing to me is the way the Patriots have attacked the Colts in their last four meetings in the Andrew Luck era. It's been decidedly run heavy, like really drastic to the point where they're running the ball 55 to 60 percent of the time against the Colts. When they play the rest of the league, they're throwing 55 to 65 percent of the time. Um, I don't know if that's going to continue. It's really hard to say. The Colts have revamped their front. They have a bunch of new guys on the defensive line, a bunch of new guys. At the linebacker position, can they actually step up and stop guys like LeGarrette Blunt and Jonas Gray from running for 200 yards and four touchdowns? I don't know. I I mean, to me, I talked about this with Jeff Howe, the Boston Herald beat reporter, yesterday. Like, embarrassing the Colts is clearly the priority 
for the Patriots, but wouldn't it be even more embarrassing to just like run the ball down their throat for a 60 to seven win? I don't know. That's why I'm kind of like scared to pay up for Brady. What if they just go all blunt and Dion and just completely bash him that way? Um, but I don't know, you know, even if you throw 55, just even if you run 55% of the time, there's still a lot of room for Brady, for Gronk, for Edelman. We know how much the Colts have struggled with slot receivers. I like Edelman. I think people are going to be off Gronk because he's kind of burned them the last two weeks. I think that's a mistake. People should definitely be back on Gronk. Um, so, yeah, this is, a, you know, a hard game for me to decipher. I'm not sure exactly what I want to do. I don't know if I want to go Deion Lewis um, out of fear of a blunt game, but I, I think that Lewis is safe. because like, you know, everybody assumes the Pats are just going to smash them. What if the Pats don't smash them? Then it's going to be a lot more Deion Lewis than maybe a lot of people expect. And and that's my uh, – you kind of just summed exactly my feelings up as far as you've got four paths that you could easily use, but, you know, rostering all those guys in a DraftKings lineup might be a little bit much. So do you hedge with certain players? Because I, I like Edelman and I, I love Lewis. Like just watching Todos con Lewis, as we've nicknamed him in the DFS community, uh, that touchdown he scored on Sunday was remarkable. Just – absolutely nasty uh and and so i i want Dion lewis and uh, for me it's like it, i want Dion lewis more than i want gronk um and I, I want edelman probably more than i want gronk I- as well does that make me a bad person andrew no okay so the thing with Dion lewis especially on DraftKings, is that i think he's going to catch at least four or five balls kind of regardless of how it plays out um that's what he's been doing and and even if they stomp him He'll probably do that early in the game, and he, he's an awfully strong play. Uh, and, and the team total for the Patriots is 31.3 right now. So that's monster. On the road, man. And the other thing uh, is that the Indy run defense has been better this year, so maybe they recognize that. I mean, for anyone that watched the Thursday night game last week, Nuck was – he didn't have anyone within 15 feet of him any pass. I couldn't believe it because I didn't. I ended up fading him because I thought, hey, Monte Davis is probably going to be on him, and he, he's wide open. So uh, I could see that happening again. If there's just receivers wide open and across the field, they're going to throw the ball, and th- they're going to get theirs. And, you know, I don't love playing teams on the road, but this seems like an exception. So uh, the more I think about it, the less worried I am, and the more Patriots I want. <laughs> okay. On the opposite side of the ball, someone weigh in quick on Moncrief versus Andre Johnson. Ooh. One guy is dead and one guy is a rising star. Okay. That dead guy scored a lot of points <laughs> last week. He uh, crawled into the end zone for one. So, so Drew, why did Drew, why did he score all those points last week? Huh, I don't know. Random variance. <laughs> <laughs> or against his old team. So uh as far as Moncrief goes this week, would he be a GPP option for anyone? Yeah. He's 5K, so he can be considered. But I'm really I'm concerned about Luck and his health. There's weird reports coming out of Indy. They were saying he was practicing in full, but then they weren't letting anyone in to watch him practice. Uh, and now there's reports coming out that he might not even play. Uh, the, the spread on the game is 7.5, so uh, they don't expect it to be. That's, that's pretty big for, for, for at Indy. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Um, I'm worried about him. You you could play Lock or some of those guys in tournaments because you just never know. But I recognize that Lock's almost certainly not going to be 100 percent this week. The the line is inflated because the entire country is wrapped up in this Deflate Gate Bowl narrative. Nobody in the world is giving the Colts a chance in this game. The real line is probably like five and a half, six. They blew it up because they know they're going to get an insane amount of money on the Patriots. Or maybe the Patriots are just that good. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, if you look back to 2007 when they obviously rolled everyone, it took till about week 10 before – I think they covered the spread like the first 10 weeks of the season. And then it got to the point where they were like 21-point favorites against the Jets. Yeah. Or something insane. You guys, it was so crazy, and then it ended up being a close game. But, yeah, I don't know. I think this Patriots offense is going to continue to roll. The- so I, I think it could be helpful if we each ranked our Patriots in terms of priority. Because I, I think everybody wants to use Patriots. Mm-hmm. Okay, Drew? Um, so my, my ranking would be Gronk. I think you should honk for Gronk. Then, I th- then Deion Lewis. 
then Brady, then Edelman, then Blunt in terms of cash games. But I think Blunt's a really good tournament player. Um, Adam? Dion first, Brady last, and uh, and Gronk and Edelman tied for second. Oh, you can't do that. You can't tie for rankings. For, ca- for cash, I'll go Edelman. For tournaments, I'll go Gronk. Uh, mine was the same as Drew's, but I would say that I don't think Blunt's a good tournament play because I think a lot of people will play him. He's actually been – he was fairly well on last week, and – there's going to be a lot of this narrative about them running the ball. And I think Blunt will go over owned based on what I haven't projected doing. Now that's not to say that he couldn't have 150 yards and three touchdowns, but we're going to pray to the fantasy guys that that's not what happens. All right. Yeah. And mine would be, uh, uh, some of mine depends on this Larry Donnell uh, stuff, but uh, as, as far as me, I'd be kind of with Adam as far as Lewis Edelman, Gronk, Brady, Blunt. So if a month ago, if I told you guys you could have Rob Gronkowski or Julian Edelman for the same exact price, I just, I'm, I'm never picking Edelman in that spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on like lineup construction, though. Like if you have two tight ends, I could see it. But the way that the tight ends on DraftKings have been this year, um, like you can just find so much value. And so if you're going three running back, like you're talking about cash, kind of what Adam was saying, if you go three running backs and then – uh, you you can't go two tight ends like you can't put Gronk in the flex so you would immediately use that savings to pay up for wide receiver and I guess that's my feeling as far as this week but I I agree if if you're playing a flex spot like especially in a GPP I would put Gronk over Edelman just of for what he could do Gronk is hungry he hasn't eaten in a couple of weeks. Okay, there we go. That's the that's narrative street we're wanting. Let's move on to the <laughs> next game. That was the tight end whisperer. That was the tight end whisperer right there. Listen. <laughs> well, Gronk averages a touchdown a game, basically, and he's gone two games without touchdowns. So oh, he's gonna score. That means he gets three. Time to, yeah. Me, Gronk, me hungry. Did you see the, uh, I think it was the, maybe a Reddit asking anything when someone asked Edelman if he could read? <laughs> and he said, uh, he could read defenses, and he said, so the answer is no, and he's like, Fair, good enough. That's basically <laughs> what he said. So, good stuff. Uh, as far as this last game, this will be, this could, like, these primetime games are two good primetime games. Uh, the Giants at the Eagles, always uh, an interesting story, and people swore two weeks ago that they would be off of Bradford, off of this Eagles offense, now, with the exception of Jordan Matthews, people are starting to talk, okay, well, maybe Bradford in cash because he has figured it out. Uh, Drew, are you of that mindset? So the only reason I'm not on Bradford in cash is because of the price tag relative to some of these other options we talked about. I think he has the same risk profile as some of these other options, so I'd rather just take the few extra $100. But I do like this matchup quite a bit for Bradford, and I'll definitely have exposure in tournaments. The strength of the Giants' defense is, is their run defense has been playing really well and their outside corners. And the strength of Philadelphia's pass offense is the middle of the field. So I think this matchup, just in terms of personnel, really suits uh, what Philadelphia likes to do. Tremaine McBride is the slot corner. He's not very good. Um, Prince Amukamura is the Giants' best corner. He looks doubtful for this game. So they could be down one of their two solid corners. Um, And I think it's a good matchup for Jordan Matthews. I think it's a good matchup for Bradford to use the middle of the field with some of the tight ends. So I like Bradford. I again like Jordan Matthews. I hope he he has his gloves uh, ready to to catch some balls and not drop some balls. Um, But I, I like both of those options this week. Yeah, better hope he has a stick them ready. Yeah. Uh, Adam, as far as your thoughts on this game? Yeah, I'm scared because I'm not in love with really any plays in this game. And I'm, you know, if I have zero PMR going into Monday night, I'm just going to see my contest winning. It's just be like, like Andrew Wiggins style, just like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah, you know, I don't think Bradford has quote unquote figured it out. I think he's strung together two good statistical games, but it doesn't feel to me like it's clicking like it was in the preseason. Um, he still doesn't seem to be totally comfortable running the no huddle. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not anxious to roster Bradford. I would prefer to go down to Kaepernick or Stafford or Dalton. Um, I'm not anxious to roster 
Jordan Matthews, given how poorly he has been playing. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I don't see a ton of plays in this game. I like the Larry Donnell call. I wish I could roster Odell Beckham, but I can't pay 9000 for a guy with his hamstring history and considering he has another hamstring that had swelling and had the need for an MRI. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, not a lot of plays for me in this game, but that, that definitely scares me. I want, I want to have PMR. I live for PMR. Andrew, what about DeMarco Murray? Mm. 6K going on a Monday night. Yeah, I mean, for a tournament, sure. But that run game, it's like Ryan Matthews has looked better than DeMarco, and he should be getting more touches. He's not. And it's important to, to, to base your decisions on what's going to happen, not what you think should happen. But I still think there's a high risk there. Uh, and, and just all the, the risk we've already talked about with the Philly offense. So if I'm going to go at their offense, I'm going to go at Bradford, I'm going to go at Matthews. I do think their ownership will be a little bit more elevated this week because Bradford did have a good game last week, at least fantasy-wise. Uh, he did throw two interceptions in the red zone. So that, that means two things. One, it could have been a lot better game, but also, two, that's pretty alarming that he did it not once but twice. That's a really, really bad thing. Um, and it's Monday night. So people like having those Monday night players. That immediately raises their ownership. So I, I like those guys. I think they're a little bit too expensive, and I'm a little bit concerned about the ownership in tournaments, but I will have shares of them. And Odell, like, it's a really frustrating situation because it's a great spot for him. I don't think you – unless something comes out that he's feeling close to 100%, I don't know. You can't even trust these reports. It's a really tough spot. I think people will own him, uh, but I, I, won't, I don't think I'll be one of them. Maybe a little bit in some tournaments, certainly not in cash. And we've got the Reuben Randall injury too that we're, we're going to wait on information about. Because, I mean, if, if, if they're playing without Randall and Beckham – that's a really watered down offense just in terms of skill position talent. And that could, that could kind of just throw a, a huge wrench in the entire offense's functionality. So this is a game that I think you have to monitor injury information on the giant side of the ball throughout the week. And it's one of the tough ones because it's a Monday night um, that we hope we get some clarity before uh, Sunday. The yeah. sneaky play in that offense is Shane Vereen because I think if those guys are out or even just hurt, They'll be more involved in the passing game. He'll have a pretty high floor with the PPR. And he's only 4,200. So he's a guy I haven't really heard mentioned much out there that, that I like a pretty good amount. And Dwayne Harris at 3,100 if both those guys, both those receivers can't go. I mean, he's he's not great, but had six catches for 72 yards. It feels like he was getting all of the Odell plays last week. Um <laughs> He's been good, and shout out to one of my business partners, Adam Hummel, who last week kept telling me he was going to put Dwayne Harris in all of his lineups, and I kept telling him, I don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and Harris Harris had a pretty good game. Uh, not a bad yeah. game, like 6 for 74. So uh, Harris could be on the radar this week if the Giants' injuries uh, at the wide receiver position thin out that roster. Yeah, the one thing I would disagree with Andrew about is the Matthews ownership. I think people are tired of him, and his price means that uh, he, he could be a sneaky play. I don't think people are going to be on him more than they were last week just because of the dud, the drops issue. I think that there are better options, and as the big, as the president of the Jordan Matthews fan club, I'm not rostering him this week, so I'll just go ahead and wow. – yeah. I know, right? So well, you just guaranteed a monster game from him. So well, I probably probably did. I'm the anti wide receiver whisperer. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, one game you have to choose to play this week, guys. What is it? Detroit, Chicago. Oof. I would go. With, I would go with New England. Just their Peter. side. Their side of the ball. Peter. Uh, yeah, Andrew. I mean, those are the two obvious ones. Um, just kind of skimming. I mean, really, that Monday night game, if you're willing to take some risk on these players, I think it could be a real shootout-type game. So, uh, risky for sure, but Jordan Matthews and, and Bradford, really, they're going to have a big game, the two of them combined at some point. So, maybe this is the, the time that happens. And uh, for tournaments, yes, don't play them in cash. It was a trick question. the The answer was New England at Indy. So, well, obviously, that's the only. Answer. You can figure out the New England offense. You're going to have a nice week. So, Houston and Jacksonville will be it. the other one. I think all of it. Just, I mean, stack stack the backup quarterbacks. The back, like <laughs> everybody, they're going to score hundred. 
All right. That will do it for the week six matchup breakdown. Um, and we'll be having the hangout show on Sunday night. We'll be having the sweat show on Monday night. So it should be fun with those two primetime games. Uh, special thanks to Adam Levitan, Andrew Wiggins, and Drew Dinkmeyer. I'm David Kitchen. Best of luck in your week six matchups, and we'll see you later.